to continue today in this series that I started on, I guess, two weeks ago. Uh, and we called it Time. Time. And uh, one of the things that we discovered about this word time, and the first use of it in the Bible, you find uh, the first use of the word time in the Bible in the book of Genesis, where the scripture says that Cain in the process of time, and he brought an offering to God of the fruit of the ground. And this particular word time comes from a Hebrew word in the Bible, <coughs> And it's pronounced as yom. And this particular word is uh, used in the Bible 2,287 times. And uh, 2,008 of those times, the same Hebrew word is interpreted as the word day. And so if you're reading your Old Testament and you see the word day, uh, 2,008 of those times, it is, when you go into the original language, it is this word yom. And 64 times uh, the word time is actually, this word yom is interpreted as time, and uh, 14 times is interpreted as the word year. And so we see uh, connected to this particular Hebrew word uh, different units of time. We see connected to this Hebrew word units of time. And what do I mean when I say units of time? Well, we see that the same word is interpreted 2,008 times as day. And so we know by reading the book of Genesis that an evening in the morning is the first day. It's a period of 24 hours, per se. Uh, we also have here uh, the unit of time that we call uh, the unit of time that we call the year. And that is also uh, a unit of time. And God has given uh, these heavenly ordinances, and we know a year, a year is roughly 365 days. God has given these heavenly ordinances, these heavenly bodies, excuse me, in the heavens to give us our uh, units of time. And if you've been here the past few weeks, I know I kind of mentioned this, but I'm building on something. <laughs> I am building on something. So uh, just forgive me if it seems like I'm being a little uh, redundant. I am building on something. And so in the book of Genesis, God has given us these different heavenly bodies for the units of time. And that's important because we have to understand that God wants us to use time. He wants us to understand time. This is a lesson that God has for us. For example, in Genesis 1 and 14, it says that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the night, the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for year. Now, we know that these lights, of course, is the sun, moon, and he also, there's also the inclusion of the stars. But specifically, we have the sun and the moon that God has given us for the days and the years and for the seasons, etc. And of course, we get the day when the earth rotates one single time on its axis. That's how we get the day. It takes about 24 hours for that to happen. That's our evening and our morning, and I'm just quoting the book of Genesis for the definition of the day. Our month comes from the moon circling around the earth. It takes about 30 days for the moon to circle around the earth one time. And we get our years from, of course, the earth going around the sun. It takes roughly 365 days for that to happen. God has given these heavenly ordinances to give us units of time. We understand the concept of the week when we read the book of Genesis and we realize that God created the world in seven days. And he started that work on a Sunday and he finished that work on a Saturday. And the Saturday is, of course, our Sabbath, the day of the quote-unquote rest that God uh, has had established. And God actually did a lot of significant things on Sunday. Uh, I think it's very interesting that we see that not only did he begin the work of creation on a Sunday, which is the first day of the week, but Jesus also rose from the dead on a Sunday. And then, you, know, you, you, you find that in the scriptures written very clearly. 
Also, the Holy Spirit was poured out on a Sunday. How many of you know that it was a Sunday morning when the power of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost? Well, you say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, the scripture says so. In uh, Leviticus chapter 23, it says, And you shall, count on you, uh, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day which you brought forth the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, what he's talking about was the feast of the first fruit, which occurred after Jesus died on the cross. The third day, Jesus rose during the feast of the first fruits. And he says, on tomorrow after the Sabbath, which is a what? A Sunday, he says, count unto you seven Sabbaths, which is what? Fifty days from the day that they brought forth the first fruits. For us, in the New Testament, that would be exactly fifty days from the day Jesus rose from the dead. How many of you know that the Bible says Jesus showed himself for forty days? With many infallible proofs that he rose from the dead, right? That's an act, right? So if he showed himself for 40 days, how many days were the disciples in the, in the upper room before the Holy Spirit came? Come on. Ten. Ten. There you go. Thank you, young man. Ten days. Were they in the upper room? If he showed himself 40 days, in a day when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Pentecost, talking about 50 Pentecost. That was the 50th day. Quoting Leviticus 23 and 15, where it talks about the, the Feast of the Latter First Fruits or the Feast of Pentecost. It was the 50th day, which was a Sunday, first day of the week, power of God fell. God fulfilled his promise, sending forth the promise, the power to be witnesses on earth, fell on Sunday. And so again, God has given us these heavenly ordinances for times, seasons, days, and years. Now, if you are here uh, in this whole thing of time, what we have to realize is that time is important to us because God has established a creation. And this creation is subject to time. It is subject to God. And God's use of time. For example, let me give you this verse of scripture in Revelation chapter 8, 1 verse 8, excuse me, chapter 1, Revelation 1 8. It says, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. First letter, last letter of the alphabet. The beginning and the ending. And he says, beginning and the ending afterwards to show that he's being synonymous here. And he says, Then said the Lord, which which is, which was, which is to come. In other words, God's saying, I'm the present, the past, and the future when it comes to this creation. And then he says, I am the Almighty. Now, the beginning and the end is only important when it comes down to the creation. There is a beginning of the creation. There is an ending of the creation. And God has given these different heavenly ordinances to time it out. There was a first day of the creation, and then there was a last day. How many of you know that God started the work, if you actually use the Hebrew calendar, He started the work of creation around 3,761 B.C. You say, well, how do you get that, Pastor? Well, we're currently in Hebrew year 5777. If you subtract 2016, that only leaves you 3,761. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it's roughly 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. From Christ to Adam to Christ. And we've been counting 2,016 2, years from that time. After, of course, B.C. 1, and you keep, I mean, not B.C. 1, A.D. 1, and you keep counting, 2,016 years. So it's roughly a uh, 3,761 years if you subtract that 2016. Again, if you just round it off 4,000 years roughly from Adam to Christ, 3,761 3, years. Anyway, a week ago we started and we talked about, uh, and we were talking about this fullness of this creation. I want to read this verse to you in the book of Ecclesiastes, 
So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Because God has given time and, and, and associated with time these different units. And we read about the units in the book of Genesis. You see the wheat uh, established by God when he created the world in seven days. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I want to read this verse of scripture to you. Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says, And he hath made everything beautiful in its time. A thing can only flourish in its time. It cannot flourish before its time. It cannot flourish after its time. It can only flourish in its time. And it's, this work is subject to God. When I say this, I kind of think about the fact that Sarah gave birth to Isaac at the appointed time. How many of you know that there was an appointed time for her to give birth? To Isaac. I actually wanted to read that verse to you. An appointed time. That's important to us. Because many of us are waiting on God to do things for us. But what we're waiting for is for an appointed time. It doesn't mean he won't do it. It don't mean he don't plan on doing it. It's just for an appointed time. It goes with what Sister Vera was saying. A heart deferred, a hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yes. Maybe your hope is deferred this morning. Ooh, Jesus. Come on, but maybe your desire is set for an appointed time. And when it comes, it will be a trail of yes. yes. There's an appointed time for this thing. I think about how good he was to him. God not only gave her a child, but she gave, gave her a prophet. Prophet of whom the scripture says God didn't let not one of his words fall to the ground. That's something. Let me read this verse of scripture to you about the appointed time. And again, I want, to, I want to read this because Genesis 18 and 13. Genesis 18 and 13. And again, what am I establishing here? We were talking about everything being made beautiful in its time. And we've come up now with the concept of, of what's written in Scripture as appointed time. And so nothing can really flourish until it comes into its time. And God even uses the concept of time. God didn't even give Sarah Isaac until the appointed time. So even God himself stuck to this thing. It's kind of like what the scripture says in Ephesians. He works everything after the counsel of his will. In other words, there's a finished will in heaven yes, yes. that God uses to do things on the earth. Yes. And if God's will say this baby ain't coming to this year, that baby is not going to come one second before. It's not going to come one second after. It's going to come at the exact appointed time that it is written in God's finished work for it to come. Not one second before, not one second after. Yes. And nobody can change it and nobody can stop it. Amen. Genesis 18 and 13 says it like this. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah lie? Saying, Shall I surety bear a child with your mother? Sometimes God gives us promises that we'll laugh at. Because we don't think we're going to have it. God got a sense of humor. She said, I want you to name this child. I want you to name the child Isaac, which means laughter. Yeah. I want you to remember when you laughed at me. <laughs> when I give you this thing. I want you to remember when you laughed at me. When I give you what I promised you. Every day you look at it, you don't remember that I laughed at God when, I, when he told me he was going to do this thing. You look at the promise fulfilled. 
I want you to call it laughter. Laughter. Mm. I want you to remember. My Lord. The Bible goes on to say, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall the Lord, for of a surety, of, shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? And in the scripture goes on to say in verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? How many of you know that when God brought Joshua and Caleb into uh, the promised land, they were strong? The Bible said they still had their strength. You hear what I'm saying? He, he made them wait it out in the wilderness yeah. with the generation that died. Yeah. Yeah. Stay in this thing for 40 years and you're going to die off because you said I wouldn't give it to you. Yeah. But he kept them strong. Oh, I know I made you wait it out with them, but I'm going to keep you strong Jeez. until I deliver the promise into your hand. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Is anything too hard from the Father Lord? I don't care how impossible it looks. I don't care if it looks so crazy that you got to laugh about it. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is no if you didn't know. Because God said, at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. Jesus. See, when God has a promise for you, it's for an appointed time. Amen. And it's for a time in your life. Yes. Amen. How many of you know God going to do it before you die? Amen. Yes. You might be old, but he's going to do it before you die. Amen. It's a time. Yes. Yes. A time in your life. Hmm. But it's for an appointed time. And when the appointed time comes, in your time of life, mm. he said, I'm going to return to you. Yes. I'm going to visit you. Yeah, Lord. Uh -oh. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. I'm going to visit you. Yes. Isn't that like when the heavens open up over you and God just sin because he says, i got to keep a promise. Yes. Yes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's just like Moses coming to the burning bush. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Because God made a promise to Abraham that your seed would be us be servants in a country for 400 years. But after that, I will visit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's nothing like Moses coming to that time after that 400 years and all of a sudden you see a bush burning with fire because God made a promise to a man over 400 years ago. And he said, I'm going to keep it now. You hear what I'm saying? He is a God that keeps promises. That's why his name is Jehovah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jehovah meaning Yahweh means existent. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He lives eternally so that he can keep whatever covenant he makes with you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's why he can make a promise to David and say to him, you're going to always have a light before me in Israel. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Or he can say to Jacob, uh, to Judah through Jacob, the scepter would not depart from you. Nor the lawgiver from between your feet to Shadow come. Speaking of Jesus. The tranquility that he would bring in the millennial reign. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There was a line of kings that came through David all the way up to Christ because God was keeping his promise that he made to a man who God was impressed with to the point that he kept a promise that affected generations after. Saying. His name is Jehovah. His name, Yahweh, meaning existent. He ever lives to keep promises. Yes. Yes. I'm thinking about Melchizedek. Oh, let me let me read a verse to you. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews. Turn your Bible to Hebrews. Why I got this verse in my spirit. Bible to Hebrews. Chapter 6. We were talking about God making things beautiful in His time and how there's an appointed time and how there's a time of life. 
God has given us an assurance in Jesus. I want to read this verse to you. And it speaks a little bit about the nature of God. I don't see in the scripture where God give promises. Well, let me say it like this. When God swear and give his oath. Because the children of Israel that were in the wilderness... God decided that they would die in the wilderness, that generation. He said, you should know my breach of promise. You, you know my breach of promise. In other words, I promised you something, but I'm not going to give it to you because you didn't believe it. He breached his own promise. And so there's a difference, difference between when God simply makes a promise to you, and many times when God makes a promise, you've got to catch the fine print. Many times it's conditioned. If you do thus and such, I will do thus and such. You hear what I'm saying? But when God says, I swear. When God says, this is my oath. And he swear it to you. It's coming. There is no breach of promise in that. He has to do it. He is obligated by his word. He's obligated by his character. He's obligated by simply who he is. But his name is holy. And he has to keep his promise. See, it's something when God, when he say, I swear to you. If somebody can prophesy over you and they say, I hear the Lord saying, he swear to you. If that's a word from the Lord, you can take that to the bank. Take it to the bank. You can take that thing to the bank. It is out. It is coming. Sure. Let me read this verse to you. Hebrews 6.13. I'm going to start there. It says, And when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear, God swore, by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Sure, blessing will I bless thee and multiply. I will multiply thee. And then the scripture says, and so after he had patiently endured. Mm. You know, sometimes you got to patiently endure. Ooh. Ooh. He said, I'm a blessing. He said, I'm a multiply. But sometimes you have to patiently endure. That's when the comes in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you have to patiently endure. The next verse says, where it says he obtained the promise. God swore. He said, sure. In blessing I will bless thee and multiply and I will multiply thee. And it goes on to say, for me verily swear by the greater. And an oath for a confirmation is to the end of all strife. In other words, people give their oath so that they can end strife. I promise you this. And people say, okay, you made the promise. I'm selling this. You didn't gave me your word. We good. We cool. I believe you're going to do it. Yeah. It ends strife. Where God more willing, God willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, the unchangeable nature of it, confirmed it by an oath. Now here's another part in scripture where God says, this is my oath. I promise you this. I swear I'm God. This is God swearing. This is God giving an oath. That by two immutable things in the which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope which is set before us. And what is this hope? Which hope we have for an anchor of the soul. Think about the soul. The soul is part of you, which you desire, your emotions. God says, I want you to be anchored in something. Yes, yes. Because I gave something with an oath. And not only that, but guess what? It's impossible for me to lie. Yes, Jesus. Two unchangeable things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Come I on. gave you an oath. You can't change that. And it's impossible for him to lie. Come on, Now look at what he goes on to say. Sure, oh, sure and steadfast, which entereth in into 
that within the veil, this is Jesus behind the veil, in the presence of the right hand of God, where a forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The priesthood of Christ was established by an oath. In Psalms 110, when God says, I swear and I will not repent. See, when he swear, there's no repentance. Oh, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Now, if he, if he don't swear it to you, then there could be a breach of promise if you don't keep your word. But if he swear it to you, there's no repentance to that swear. And he said, Jesus, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we know that Jesus, of course. And that's why we have this anchor of the soul. There's this one that we can always go to because he's established by God forever, confirmed by an oath by God, who it's impossible for him to lie. And we have Jesus as a high priest standing there, ready to make an atonement for our sins. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A righteous king. Priest and king after the order of Melchizedek, ready to make intercession for see what time it is. Okay. I don't know why I wanted to encourage you in that, but I just wanted to. That's the oath of God. I don't know who, who God may have sworn something to, but you better take it. Take it to the bank. You might have to patiently endure, but yeah. you can take it to the bank. You can take it to the bank if you hear the words, I swear from God. You can take that thing to the bank. <clears throat> So let me go back to Ecclesiastes 3, because I was reading a scripture we was talking about, I went on this rabbit trail, from he makes everything beautiful in his time. But before that, we were reading about how God is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So let me read this verse to, read verse to you. And uh, the reason... But why I'm kind of reading this verse is because I, there was a, uh, a revelation uh, uh, of, of, a, of two versions, if I may say, of the counsel and will of God. There's, there's, there's two versions of it. And here is the two versions. There is a finished work and a progressive work. The finished work dictates to the progressive work. And the progressive work comes into being over time. <clears throat> I want to show you evidence of this in Scripture. Finished work and progressive work. So, in Ecclesiastes 3 and 11, it says, He hath made everything beautiful in His time, and He hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God made from beginning to the end. Now what is the world? What is the world? It's the creation. The fullness of the creation. God's creation as it relates to man. Now we know we got the angels and that which is, which is in the third heaven. But I'm talking about the fullness of this creation as it relates to man. Now, the first world was destroyed by water. And the, at the end, God is going to destroy it by fire. You know, he's going to do that by his face. But this world has a first day. You read in the book of Genesis that there be light. Light will shine on the first day. And then there is a last day. Mm -hmm. And so, when the scripture says he had set the world, the world symbolizes the fullness of the creation. He says, from beginning to end represents time associated with this creation. And then he says, I have set it in their hearts. So no man can find out the work of God from the beginning to the end. So what is God actually saying there? God is hidden in your and my spirit the fullness of the creation from beginning to the end. The scripture says he has set the world in their heart. Where's your heart? It's your spirit. And he says, from beginning to the end. That means from Adam to the very last man, 
when God shows up and destroys this thing by his face. The fullness of that information is hidden in your spirit. He said, I set it in their hearts. And then he says, so that no man can find out the work of God from the beginning to the end. And basically what that means is, is you and I, we cannot search out our hearts. God is able to search out our hearts. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. He searches the inward parts of the belly. Now, the scripture also says this in Proverbs 25 and 3. The heaven for height, earth for depth, the heart of the kings is unsearchable. In other words, uh, you cannot search out your heart. Therefore, the information is in you that tells you that every single thing that Adam did from every day to every minute to every part of every hour of his existence is somewhere hidden in you. But only God knows his name. It's hidden in you. He set the world in their heart from beginning to end. He put it in there. Now you say, well, why would God search it there? Why would God put that there? He put it there to give you the information you need to live out your life. That's the only thing he's bringing into light to you. Unless you have a spiritual gift where he shows you other things at the time, right? Can you hear what I'm saying? Let me read a verse of scripture to you. Have you ever heard the scripture about the uh, the preparations of the heart? How many of you remember that verse? Proverbs 16 and 1. Proverbs 16 and 1. Now you have to understand why God put this verse here. What does this verse mean? Why is it even in the Bible? Proverbs 16 and 1 says it like this. And I'm going to land in a minute. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, this theological lesson. I hope you're hearing things you never heard before. Because you have enjoyed coming to church today. I would love for you to live on the edge of your seats in shock. Wondering if Pastor know what he's talking about because we've never heard anything like this before in our lives. That's right. Well, I just showed you the scriptures. Amen. The scripture says he set the world in your heart. That's his creation. So that no man can find out the work of God from beginning to the end. Then he says in another place, your heart is unsearchable. But what does it bring to light? The information you need for you. Let's keep reading. Watch this. Proverbs 16 and 1. He says, the preparations of the heart in man. And the answer of the tongue is what? From the Lord. Lord. There is a finished work in heaven that says you're going to curse such and such out. You're going to curse such and such out. On the 15th day of the seven month at 6 o'clock when they tell you that they dropped your kid on the head. <laughs> you're going to curse them out because you're going to be sick of them. So, right when you find out that your kid was dropped on the head at this new babysitter, <laughs> your heart is going to begin to search about what I'm going to say. <laughs> God in his foreknowledge from the foundation of the world has a finished word. And have the exact words that you're going to say to such and such as a result of them dropping your kid on, your head, on the head. <laughs> When you search your heart, you're going to start hearing words to say. <laughs> you, da 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 And y'all trifling, da 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 where your manager at, da 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 And you call the, the, the city, the state, and you're going to pull your license, da 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 You already said that before the foundation of the world. And when you search your heart, that world that he hid in your heart has those words that you said in it. And that's what he reveals to you. You about you. Wow. Every single decision that you ever make is already written. Yes. And when you search your heart, because that's where it's hid, yes. you know exactly what to say. Oh, Jesus. Me up here preaching to you. 
was done before the foundation of the world. That example I just gave you was already written in a book from the foundation of the world. When I looked into my heart and I said, what should I say? Those words came to my heart. Why? Because it's already finished. And I'm simply saying what was already done. And God consented to it. Said, I'll give it. And it's established and finished. And it will manifest over the process of time. God will allow to manifest because it's already written before the foundation of the world when somebody tells a lie to you. And he allowed, because it's already established before the foundation of the world, when his spirit comes on somebody and they speak to you prophetically. He'll allow from the foundation of the world when he determined that I'll let a demon be in the midst of the king and let him let him listen to lies. How many of you remember that in the scriptures? God said, a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. So they prophesy under the inspiration of the spirit and they're saying what they hear. But what they're hearing is a lie because God sent a lying spirit. And God determined that because he had already determined that it was time for this king to die. So all that demons come in his midst. A lot of demons come in his midst and influence the prophets that prophesied to him. To get him to go where I want him to go so that he can die. How many of you remember that scripture in the Bible? How many of you know I'm not lying when I make this when I say this story? Raise your hand if you know I'm not lying. I got witnesses that that's in the Bible, right? All right? Or do we need to read it? The point is, is that a lie was told, but that lie was already established before the foundation of the world. A finished work. How can God put the world in somebody's heart from beginning to end if it's not already finished? It's already finished. And he's said it in your heart. And I, I've given this example before, but this example came from the Lord, and I'm going to share it with you again. How does the computer know to do what it do except it is programmed to do it? Amen. Somebody has to write into it when they push the power button, you do these things, and these different programs will come up. Something is written in the internal code of that computer that tells it what to do when you push the shift button. It tells it what to do when you push the space bar. It tells it what to do when you push the L button. It tells it what to do when you push control or delete at the same time. And you need this thing to give you the tax, the tax manager. Because you need to shut our program. That's what God sitting in the world the world in your heart does for you. It tells us what to do. We live out what he has already finished. And in the process of time, we come to know the perfect will of God for our lives. The, the, the complete and perfect will of God. What he has finished and established before the foundation of the world. Well, I think I need to buy stock today. You can't give me too much today, right? So I end this. You know I'm approaching the run. I have to get you out of here. The only thing that I want to share with you, and I want to read at least one verse to you to show you the progressive version. Because I said there was a finished version and a progressive. And I want to read one verse at least to show you the progressive. So let me read you one verse to show you. Version of the book. Turn uh, to, uh, well, let me read one verse to you and then I want to show you. I'm going to read one verse to you to show you the, the, uh, the finished version. And this is where I'm getting ready to go. So you can say, get ready to go home and eat chicken. Church is over. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 17. And we're going to get ready to end with these next two verses. I promise you, you're pretty much done. I don't want to give you too much today. There's so much here. Lord. 
Revelation 17 and 8. Again, I'm trying to build on something, so again, forgive me if it sounds a little redundant. But I need you, I need this to be firm in you because you'll see things differently now. Yes. You'll operate differently. Yeah, Revelation 17 and 8. Watch this. You there? Revelation 17 and 8. You come here to learn about God and life and how this thing works. Now watch this. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now John is getting a revelation of the Antichrist. And shall go forth into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, when you look at this verse of scripture, it's talking about the Antichrist who's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. How I many of you know God is the one who loses Abaddon unto the earth? Apollyon is the Greek name, Abaddon, the Hebrew version of that name. Destruction and destroying. That's what he means. It's a spirit. It's, he's called the angel of the bottomless pit. He comes out of the bottomless pit, possesses a man, and he does what he does in the earth. This is Revelation 9. The Bible says that if there's a group of people on this world, in this world when he comes, that will not worship him. Because they are written in a book in heaven. A book that was finished from the foundation of the world. Now that's the key. The book was finished before the foundation, from the foundation of the world. That means before Adam, this book was finished. Did you hear what I just said? There is a book in heaven with names on it. And when a demon come forth and possess a man and he's doing these miracle signs and wonders, there's a group of people that's going to look at him and say, I'm not worshiping you. Because their names are written in him. And it was written in a book before God even created Adam. That's the finished work. There's a group of names in heaven that live how they live, do what they do, because their names are written in heaven in a finished document. It dictates their character. It dictates what they can stand and can't stand. It dictates their burning passion for God. Yes, yes. It dictates their loneliness on their lives. Yes. To do whatever it is they do. It says, They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written. In other words, everybody else will be duped. But not that group of people. Simply because they're written in a book in heaven. And God will back up by his power what he has already written in heaven. There's a finished will and work. Now I wanted to show you the progressive that, that comes. The progressive happens over time. It's like this. Oh, that's the finished book. But there's a progressive version that as time passes, it's being formulated by the hand of God. And it's being dictated by this finished work. Now, I want to show you at least one scripture of this. Now, I just read to you this book finished from the foundation of the world, right? Right? Book of Life finished from the foundation of the world. Now, Jimmy, if you heard me say that. All right. Book of Life from the foundation of the world. Name's written. Okay. Now, watch this. This is the progressive version. All right, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. This is what we'll close.
keep reading. Revelation 3, I'm going to start at verse 1. And he said unto the, church, unto the angel of the church of Sardis, so John is writing to the pastor of the church of Sardis, These things that said he that hath the seven spirits of God, that's Jesus, and the seven stars, which are the seven angels or messengers in his, right, in his hand. He says, I know thy works, thou hast the name that thou lives, and thou art dead. In other words, you call yourself a church, but really you're spiritually dead. <clears throat> he says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain which are ready to die. In other words, he's saying, pay attention. There's some things in you that's good that's about to die. With the other things that died, pretty much. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. So this person is, 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 is starting to backslide. Maybe they were tithing in the season. And Jesus is saying, be watchful. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. They stop tithing. God says, come and fellowship with my people. They start to, to not fellowship with the people. Strengthen those things that remain that are ready to die. You have a name that you live, but you really did. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, you know that when Jesus come at you in that prophet mode, he, he leave you in crumbs when you finish with it. By the end of that conversation, you find out that you was a lustful scumbag that don't seek God, that don't pray, that think you pray, that think you tithe, but you ain't really no giver, that think you obey God, but really you slough on the face. When he finished with you, that is for your good. He does that to grow us. He does that to put us on the path. You know, some people leave church because they say the words are too hard, but that's the way you need to be. Because they're telling you some truth about yourself. Amen. And we need to leave here feeling like scumbags sometimes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And take that and go repent and get clean before God and say, help me. He said, be watchful. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. <laughs> remember now, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. Remember that word you was talking. Remember God's standard and ways. Remember what you what you received and heard. Hold fast to it. Don't quit it. Don't slow it down. Do it. Yes. And then he says, repent. Of course, you gotta repent of those things that you need to repent of. Mm -hmm. If therefore thou hast, he says, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come to thee as a thief in the night, and thou shalt not know the hour that I will come to thee. And then he says, There are a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. In other words, the whole church ain't bad. There's a few in there that's doing right. And he says, they shall walk with me in white. They are worthy. He that overcome the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's the garment of righteousness. And I will not blot out his name. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Which, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. This is the key word. He's saying, I will blot his name out of the book of life. And he threatens to do that anyway. He says, <clears throat> He that overcome shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name. I don't look like. In other words, if you overcome, mm -hmm. you repent, you hold fast, yes, yes. remember the things that you heard. Mm -hmm. If you do those things, yes. there you go, don't give me that. If you do those things, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. Now, I just read to you in Revelation 17 about a finished work done before the foundation of the world that dictated to some people that don't even exist right now because they come at the time of the beast. But in that book, it says they're going to be holy, that they're not going to worship the book, and they did the beast, and they will not worship it. But then I just read to you in Revelation 3, there's a book of that same book of life where he's erasing names out of the potential to erase names. Well, how do you account for that? There's a finished work mm -hmm. and there is a progressive work. The progressive work happens over time. Yes, yes. Happens over time. It's just like when God said, I'll give you the new covenant, the new covenant. He says, I will, he talks about how he will not remember your sins no more. I mean, you know, in a book, in, 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 in judgment, we're going to be judged by some things that are written in the book, right? Yes. But if you repent and give your life to God, he'll erase your sins. That's a progressive work. Mm -hmm. But there's a finished work that already knows yes. exactly what you're going to do and exactly if God is going to erase your sins or not. Yes. So that's it. I tried to get it out. I tried to explain it the best I could. And I hope you got it.
If you haven't learned anything else today, I hope you remember the first verse I opened up with, and that, that, and that is that God is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and that He is the Almighty. Now, how is He the Almighty? Because He's already finished the work in the book. And that book controls everything. It controls all of our actions. It controls everything that we're going to do. Whether we decide to go or not go, move or not move, leave them or not leave them, stay with them or not stay with them, it's already written. And as soon as we prepare our hearts, the preparations of the heart and answer the tongues from the Lord, it, it, all we got to do is look within. And we already know what to do. And you're going to do exactly what you hear and what you feel. And God has established it and finished it before the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for this word. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for your power, your presence in this place. Lord, I pray that you would continue to expand our understanding of what we've learned today. That you would help us to carve out time to spend time with you in worship. That your presence would come in richly and mightily. Oh, bless us, God. Bless us, God from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. And don't just bless us, but bless this house, Lord, that you've given for your own name, for, for your own worship, God. Bless those families watching via your strength that are part of this house, but are at a distance, God. Let your glory and power be where they are as well. Father, we thank you for what you've done here on today. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Now, before we go, is there anyone that needs to be washed by the blood of the Lamb? Maybe somebody dropped your kid on the head and you cursed them out this week and you realize that I need to repent. I let them have it when I could have been a little bit more patient. Maybe that was you. Maybe you told somebody off. Let's get ready to pray. Just repeat after me right where you are. You can do it right there with your mouth. Just pray. Father God, we come to you acknowledge our sin. But today, we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Change me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I accept your salvation. I accept that all of my sins have been put on Christ. And now, I stand in your perfect righteousness. Thank you for my deliverance. Thank you for my salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you really want Jesus to live in you? Raise your hand. understand how he flows as it relates to who we are in Christ Jesus. God, a risen Savior, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, Jesus is his